Hello, this is Sylvia Yanagi Sacco, Professor of Anthropology and Co-Director of the Center for Global Ethnography at Stanford University. Today I'm speaking with Yarimar Bonilla, who is Professor in the Department of Africana, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies at Hunter College and in the PhD program in Anthropology at the Graduate Center of the City University in New York. In this conversation, we discuss her use of digital and analog methods including the use of phone interviews in doing post-disaster ethnography. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today to uh, do this interview. We're very interested in the work that you've been doing. Uh, so first of all, we just wanna ask, how have you used digital tools for ethnographic research? Sure, so I think the, the kind of more, what I'm most known for is this article I wrote with my, my Stanford colleague, uh, Jonathan Rosa, about hashtag Ferguson and about thinking about Twitter and, and hashtags as possible field sites. Um, and that, that article emerged really out of my own interest in Twitter. I just, I joined Twitter at, around that time to precisely to learn about what was happening in Ferguson and to do a kind of, to, to figure out how one could do remote research. How could I write about something that was happening in St. Louis when I was in New York? Um, and, and I also became very interested in Twitter itself as a site of political activity. And so I wanted to think about what, what would be an anthropological take on, on ethnography and how would we even do that methodologically? And so part of what I wanted to do in, in that piece was to think about the possibility of Twitter as a field site or of hashtags as field sites, but in ways that didn't uh, approach Twitter or any kind of social media as a kind of closed site. Um, and so part of what I tried to, to think through in that piece was, well, how can we you know, look at what someone tweets? What kind of context do we put that in? How do we understand that in relationship to their broader political activity. Um, how do we see these as utterances? And so, you know, any any utterance that an anthropologist examines, they don't look at it in a vacuum, right? They look at it in a social relation, like what, you know, who is this person speaking to? From what position? Um, so, you know, I, I kind of had some, some tips there uh, in that piece, uh, we both did, about how to, you know, read between the lines of Twitter as well. Um, when you look at what someone tweets, you know, we have to think about uh, how many followers do they have? What kind of tweets do they have? Are, are, is, did they come to, to Twitter to, to engage in this event? Um, and so uh, that was a kind of original space of thinking for me. Um, and then since, uh, in, in the wake of Hurricane Maria, I had to think a lot about how to do remote research because again, I was in New York interested in something that was happening in Puerto Rico. And again, I, I use social media to some extent, to, to large extent to just reach out to people. I would you know, follow people on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, look at what they posted and you know, engage in social media as a kind of, as a way of doing participant observation, you know, tweet, watch what other people are writing, look at what the debates are, always understanding that similarly, if you do participant observation in a church or a community center, you know that that place is not representative of the whole society. That's one site of engagement in that society. So, you know, digital social media is one site of engagement in a, in a larger society. And I think, you know, a lot of us that are active on social media, we understand that well, you know. So I, I, you know, I, I started to reach out, like I would see someone post something that was happening in their community and I would comment on their, on their post, um, send them a message and say, hey, I'd like to talk to you more about this thing you've posted. So I also used it as a, as a way to kind of recruit participants into, into my study in a way to use, to use that language. Um, but, you know, interestingly, I have found the digital media um, to be kind of more organic, I, I integrated it very organically into my methodological toolkit. Something that had a big impact on me was analog technology. In, in the wake of Maria, a lot of people didn't have internet connection. All they had was their cell phone. I mean, they, they didn't even have electricity. And so I started calling people on the phone. 
And I recruited a team of students to do so as well. We had this big database of people that we had interviewed for survey research um, and to do focus groups. And so we started calling, you know, just calling these people up. Originally, I had asked my students to do a kind of a quick questionnaire of, of, you know, do you have electricity? Do you have running water after the hurricane? Um, and we wanted to set up uh, in-person interviews, but um, navigating the roads was so difficult after Maria and, you know, just catching someone on the phone because it, phone service itself was spotty was so uh, tough that I told my students, well, you know what, never mind. Let's not, let's not do an appointment for an in-person interview. Just do the interview on the phone. And so we ended up doing all these phone interviews that I've still been thinking a lot about how to analyze them and, and especially what to do with them because um, I feel like they have a kind of quality and texture. We, we ended up recording these using a, an app called Tape a Call. <laughs> it's, a, it's a phone app on the iPhone. Um, and so we have these long recordings and, and they're really interesting interviews because you know, a lot of the people that we could talk to during that time, they were in their homes without electricity, uh, without internet, TV, <laughs> radio, anything. So they, that made them uh, really interested in talking on the phone for a long time. But I think it also made them comfortable in a particular way. They didn't feel the gaze of a researcher observing them, that their, um, their body language wasn't being observed, if they were upset, if they cried. Um, you know, they, they, they didn't have to worry about that. They didn't have to present themselves in any particular way. Um, I imagine them in their pajamas or, you know, very comfortable clothes, maybe curled up on the couch like we like many of us do when we're talking on the phone. And I think all of that put them in a kind of, comf you know, created a kind of comfort for them um, that they really opened up in a particular way. And in addition there, you know, when I listen to the recordings of those calls, they just have a very different um, quality than a recording of an in-person interview. There's no, maybe because there's nothing other than the audio, there's no body language to, to be read into or anything having to do with the ambience, but also because there is a kind of turn taking that happens over the phone that is different from in-person conversation. And there is a kind of confessional quality you know, intimacy. And um, so that, that that experience of doing these phone interviews really got me thinking more about how to do uh, phone interviews. And since then, I, I've, I've done them more and I, I really appreciate them. I feel like I can also really focus on my questions. I can focus on listening and on taking notes. I feel like I ask better questions because as they're answering one question, I'm taking notes and thinking about where I want to go next without having to worry about, you know, how I'm reacting to what they're saying or, you know, the gestures that I'm making. Usually when I do in-person interviews, I don't take a lot of notes because I don't like to look down. I like to look right at the person. And so the ability to, to you know, to take all of that away and just really focus on the words, on the voice, on the, and also listen more on the tone of voice of the person, um, to me has led to really rich interviews. Um, and, you know, one of the questions uh, you had asked over email was if this had impacted my findings or the questions that I was asking. I don't know if it impacted in that way, but it did make me think more about how to represent this and how to, to do a kind of ethnography based on the, the nature of the data that I was collecting. And so I've been working on doing a kind of some kind of sound uh, uh, ethnography or a sound installation, something that, you know, I, I, the vision that I have is you go into a museum, put on headphones, curl up into a couch and kind of eavesdrop on this phone conversation uh, that is this interview. And I've also been working with an animator to do an animated film that pulls from the original audio from those interviews um, and, and you, you know, to have the animator kind of draw some of the things that the folks are talking about. So to me, it really opened up about forms of representation, moving beyond the text, um, and thinking about other ways of, of representing, you know, the lived experience of, of the folks that I've been working with. That's very intriguing. Uh, I the the whole your commentary on the phone interviews, I think, is really very useful um, because it points out ways in which we can get to things that we can't necessarily through face-to-face -face, uh, interviewing. I think that's a really, really um, uh, interesting and you know provocative 
subject that I think we can explore more. Can you say a little bit more about the sound ethnography that you said you were uh, had worked on? I'm, I'm intrigued by yeah, what, how did you patch things together? What kind of representation uh, and modes of presentation? Well, we're still we're still working on it because since the, the, in some ways these are found audios, what, what artists would call found audios because they weren't recorded with with the idea of doing this. So some of the recording quality is not the best and, and it wasn't systematic. Um, and so I've been debating whether to just have a very long recording or if to splice up um, some of the things that people said. One of the things that's really interesting is, is what repeats itself. So um, how to have themes and then bring in the different sounds of people talking about what it was like to not have electricity or the folks who you know, FEMA rejected me, FEMA rejected me, I got a rejection from FEMA. The kind of echo, echoing uh, statements um, I found really interesting as well. Um, and, and, you know, and a lot of it is also about what's unsaid, about the, the melancholy and the voice, uh, the, the, what, you, what you hear when people talk about losing a loved one and, and, and you hear this kind of guilt in their voice about what they weren't able to do for them in the wake of the disaster. So I feel like there, there's, there's, so, there's so much emotion um, in, in the sound you know, of, of their voice that I, that I don't think, and, and maybe also because I'm not able to paint a scene because I was not sitting in place with them. So I'm not able to describe how anything other than their voice, you know, so I can normally in, in some of my ethnographic writing, I might talk about how a person, you know, the kind of face they make or how they look to the side or, you know, a gesture they make. There's not, none of that that I can describe. Um, and yet, the, and yet there's a lot that is there in, in that sound quality. And so I think, um, you know, like, like you said, like, how can we think about these kind of remote research moments um, think about them in their potentiality and their possibility and what they open up. Um, I've been I've been trying to think about the same thing in relationship to online learning too. Like, how do we not just do a bad version of of what we do well in, in person in the classroom, but what can we do online that we couldn't do in the classroom? Or you know, how can we use these tools? So I think that for me, after after Hurricane Maria, I was trying, you know, very much, you know, and and maybe I had a little bit of a less pressure on me because it was something that I was doing just because I wanted to. It wasn't that I had set out to to study the hurricane. Um, this hurricane arrived, and I said, well, I need to know what's happening. I can't travel there, so what can I do? And I just embraced what I could do, and I also, you know, embraced team research. I worked with my with students that were in place in Puerto Rico that could tap into their social networks, which is what I'm doing now. Also with COVID is working with uh, students and doing snowball samples based on their personal network. So who do you know that's an essential worker? Um, can, can you talk to them? And can you get three numbers from, from them of coworkers, et cetera? Um, so doing all that while at the same time trying to be very sensitive and, and, and contextual to doing research in a post-disaster moment or a post-pandemic moment. You know, all, all that that in, in implies in terms of easing up um, and, and of thinking, well, what, do, what is the data that I really need? You know, what, what do, where do I need to probe and where do I not need to probe, you know? And so what are things that maybe I don't need to get out of a prying interview with someone in the midst of tragedy? And I don't need that because maybe there is a journalistic piece that, that does that and that I can cite and that I can bring into my research. Um, so that, that's the other thing, you know, that I, that I think and that, you know, that I would recommend to others to, to not just focus on the data gathering that we can do. I think anthropologists especially, you know, we create our own data, um, unlike other um, scholars who, who might go to a data set or, you know, all these things. So, so we really, we, we pride ourselves on creating on our own data and on the, the kind of uniqueness 
of, of the data that comes from an interview that we conducted. But I think there is a lot of quotes that we can get from journalistic pieces. That's something that, that I you know, pay more and more attention to, um, trying to rally ethnographic evidence um, that, I, that, that is kind of, again, like found evidence. So I, you know, reading through uh, profile pieces, listening to podcasts, um, looking also at like people who are uh, posting on social media, including YouTube and all these things. So there are ways in which we can get ethnographic texture um, and get the, you know, what, what we love, which is people, you know, talking about their daily lives and, and moving beyond like press conferences or official representations of a disaster or, or of any, you know, kind of social issue that we're interested in. We can get those, those without necessarily having to pry into people's lives, especially in a moment when they're dealing with personal emergency, social crisis, infrastructural breakdown and, and all these things. Right. So I think keeping that in mind and, and um, also, you know, I always think back to something um, my mentor, Michelle Ralph Trio, he writes about um, the, the difference between the object of observation and the object of analysis. And so not for, not losing sight of our object of analysis, but, but remaining open to what it is that we can observe in order to, to engage that object of analysis. And, and, thinking that there can be lots of different sites that we can observe in order to answer those questions. So it could be an in-person interview, which many of us love to do because many of us were pulled into this field because we like to connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but it could also you know, be pouring through painstakingly through tweets or through social media or reading between the lines of a journalistic piece or looking for kind of personal blogs that people are writing um, where they're narrating their own experiences. There's a lot of people writing diaries right now, um, logs, uh, even, you know, poetry. There's so many, there's so many sites of quote unquote data, you know, uh, imagery on, on Instagram, you know, how, how are people representing their daily life right now? So I think, you know, keeping, not losing focus of what are the questions that we that we have, but you know, Trio writes, what, what is it that I need to know in order to answer what I want to know? So there are these things that we want to know, but we need to be kind of open to what it is that we need to know in order to answer those questions. And what are the different sites where we can look for those? Uh, do you have any suggestions specifically for graduate students who are interested in using digital methods, uh, particularly if they're not necessarily focused on a research project that has a lot of media, uh, you know, data being uh, yeah. produced about it. Yeah. Well, I always tell students to, to kind of ease ease some pressure on yourself, you know, and remember that you know the best the best person to design your project is you. Like you're the one who knows what you want to know, what 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 your curiosity is, and what, you know what are the questions that have been haunting you, right? So, so stay with those questions, but be more open to where you can find those answers. And at the same time, I would say to maybe, you know, still play to your strengths a little bit. Um, understanding, however, that anthropology, ethnography is always hard. It's always hard. It's hard to walk up to, to someone at an event. It's also hard to cold call them. It's hard to reach out to DM on Twitter. Like all these things take a little bit of, you know, they, they, they can cause a little bit of social anxiety. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that you're not able to do it and that you're maybe not even fantastic at it. So I think, you know, play to those strengths. If you are a Twitter person, you know, go all in on Twitter. And, and I, I have also some like some suggestions for Twitter, you know, create some lists. Don't just depend on the timeline. Um, think about how to, you know, cut across Twitter in different ways, learn how to do advanced search. You know, if, if you're a Twitter person, if you're not a Twitter person, I think, you know, Instagram, uh, then depending also on the folks that you are interested in studying, because a lot of young people right now, they're more on Instagram than on Facebook than on Twitter. Um, so if, if that's your crowd, um, Facebook also, I, I think researchers, we love face, we love Twitter because it has such great ways of searching. Um, but there's a lot more, depending on what part of the world you work in, there's a lot more people on Facebook um, than, you know, it's, it's the biggest social media platform. But also thinking beyond social media um, to, to look again at blogs at, you know, also like even if you know just one person in your field site, 
you know, take advantage of a snowball sample, you know, ask that person for two contacts. If every, if every person you reach, you ask for two contacts, which is something that I always do. Anytime I interview someone, I always say, is there anyone else you think I should talk to about this? Um, and sometimes I ask for a kind of person, but sometimes I say just in general, who do you think would be would be someone interesting for me to talk to? Um, and I'm really curious, you know, about who, who they even think is an authority, right? Or who they say, oh, so-and-so, he's got a lot of stories or, you know, so-and-so, she she never wants to talk, but she she's always behind the scenes and these things, right? So let your informants also guide you in this, you know? And, and the other thing I would say is, you know, to, you know, I always tell anthro students in particular to not conflate ethnography and anthropology and, you know, how you can have an, an anthropological orientation to questions and to data gathering and to the way in which you pose, you know, you, you know, frame your projects. And, and, and I think the same is true for all the disciplines that engage in ethnography. You know, ethnography is one tool, but it can work in tandem with others. And you can still bring the kind of attention to either qualitative data or individual experiences or, you know, whatever it is that that, you know, attracted you to ethnography in the first place, I don't think can solely be found in ethnography. And something that I do more and more is I read I read beyond anthropology and I, I read a lot of ethnic studies. I read American studies and I learn a lot from. Um, scholars who are not trained in disciplinary methods and who have to come up with what, you know, some describe as feral methods, you know, thinking about how to read between the lines of news reports, how to, you know, I, my, my colleague Marisol Lebron, she used a police archive, you know, to do research. Um, that's, that's qualitative in nature, you know, obviously historians, we can learn a lot from them of, of how, you know, they use documents. Um, but, but I think also, especially ethnic studies folks who are really clued in to how to engage with different kinds of cultural texts. Um, and to, but, but, you know, to, to, to not feel like we have to limit ourselves um, to that kind of proximity and to also not conflate uh, rapport and connection with physical proximity, because there are ways in which, you know, I think especially um, digital natives, you know, can establish connection with people virtually long distance um, and also meeting, you know, meeting folks with the tools that they have. We also, I think, depending on the part of the world that we are doing research in, we can't count on everyone to have stable internet connections and to do Zoom calls. We can't even count on stable in, uh, stable phone connections. There's a lot of places where people have phone cards and, you know, have to really limit, you know, their data. So how do, the, how do folks in those societies uh, communicate? For example, in Puerto Rico, a lot of people use WhatsApp. And so you might, instead of having a phone or video conversation, you might want to have a series of WhatsApp messages, both texting and like audio, audio messages back and forth, you know? So to, you know, to employ all the creativity that the very people we study also have in how they're communicating and how they're maintaining some kind of social proximity, even as we are having kind of physical distancing. Well, thank you again. That is really useful and very thoughtful um, uh, uh, comments on all of this. And I'm sure that there will be a lot of uh, questions from graduate students who are able to watch this. And so we look forward to that question and answer period with you as well. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.